Hey everybody, uh, this video is going to be covering uh, one of my buddy's uh, blog posts actually. So I have a friend, a very close friend, and actually a former roommate who's a data scientist and he's been setting up a blog discussing various, uh, mostly Python related by OVP, he's touching on R as well, um, data science uh, libraries as well as different calculus and linear algebra um, topics. So I'm going to be covering a random forest classifier uh, that he's working with and it, in particular it's going to be using a uh, titanic data set which is a fairly common data set where you're using a number of variables for passengers from the Titanic to predict the uh, survival outcome of those passengers, so whether or not they survived. So real quick, just to show you, this is my, my friend's uh, blog here. So you're welcome to visit it. He has a, a several posts actually up, and they're all quite good. I've been very impressed with them. Uh, the reason for the video, though, is to kind of explain a few finer details that he kind of skates over, and he does so just because of the he's up at a slightly higher level in his post, and many people that I know who'd be interested in it are going to come in at a bit lower level. Uh, so this is meant to kind of describe that. So I'm going to start just going line by line on this, and I'm in a Jupyter notebook for anybody who's not familiar with that. So we'll talk about what we're importing here. So if you have used Python or R, um, you'll know that in order to use certain libraries, you actually have to import them. If you're coming from a MATLAB base, um, this is typically done by adding folders to a path or just by including certain toolboxes or toolkits uh, in your MATLAB uh, download. So here, we're going to be importing a random force classifier, which is actually going to be our type of model that's used. Uh, it's basically used to um, kind of just make several decisions down a series of, of leaves or levels uh, where your eventual output is going to be whether or not this person survived. It is a bit of a black box, uh, but it gets it's very high performing black box. And this is going to be imported from the scikit-learn library and the ensemble sub-library. We're going to import Seaborn, which is usually used for fancy um, graphics, uh, plots and things like that. And we're going to name it uh, SNS, which is just um, what is typically done for Seaborn. Um, but we're actually going to be using it to load our data set here. So it's, I don't believe we actually do any graphing from it. We're also going to import Pandas. Pandas is probably one of the best tools that you'll find with um, data science. It just uh, organizes your data to and has extremely useful tools uh, that you can use when your data is organized in a Pandas, what's called data frame. And we name that PD. And we're also going to imp import NumPy, that's for uh, array mathematics. Um, uh, things like that. And then we import things from the Fast AI library, and, and it's come to Fast AI 2 now. Um, Fast AI is, I think you can call it a wrapper for usability around various machine learning and data science um, uh, libraries. So things like PyTorch and Keras, if you've heard of those or use those, Fast AI wraps around those, uh, includes its own enormous range of, of, um, of methods as well, but it, it imports new methodology, new objects and things that uh, are really nice to work with. And there's also a series of courses, uh, very in-depth courses that you can take for free online if you, if you search Fast AI. So we're in the Fast AI 2 library in the tabular sub-library and we're going to import this dot all, which is a sub sub library and this asterisk just means that we're importing everything so from those li from that particular library we're going to import everything from the fast ai library in general we're also going to import everything and it's a little redundant but when importing from the um, parent library there may be some underlying libraries that are not imported which i would guess uh, the reason isaac included this is because this is one of those um, we're also going to import what's called a Grid, grid Search CV, and what this allows you to do is run several models with by tweaking the parameters, uh, and, it, and it creates a matrix, and that matrix will give you the best performing um, models, based on parameters, model parameters, uh, and that's going to be coming from the Scikit-Learn uh, under the Model Selection sublibrary, and then we have Dtree Viz Trees. That's going to allow us to uh, graphically create um, 
what's going to be essentially this hierarchy plot. It's going to be kind of a uh, relationship tree, a dendrogram, I think it's called. Uh, and then this scipy.cluster, uh, we're going to import hi hierarchy as hc, and that's actually going to be used within that dendrogram as well. Okay, so let's we went ahead and did that already. We've run it. You can tell because this line one is already uh, filled in. And we're going to create our data frame df. Once we have it, I can do data frame .head or df .head, and you'll have these uh, kind of a printout of your top five um, uh, rows in the head of your of your data. You can also do tail, and it'll be the bottom five. You can also put a number in, and it will print out that many. Okay, so you see our variables here. First, we have the indices on the far left. We have the variables on the columns, and you'll see actually a lot of redundancy here. We have a variable called survived, which is binary. It means zero means you die, one means you survive. We have another thing which is called alive, where it's no and yes, and that coincides with zero and one. So those are actually the same variable, um, but they have different names to them, so they would be called what's, what's called redundant. We also have passenger class or P class, and then if you look, it's first, second, and third. And then here we have class, which is also going to be first, second, and third. So again, we have some redundancy. Um, we also have sex, which is male and female, and who, which is man and woman. Again, redundant. Um, we also have a couple uh, not a numbers in our data set, so you can see those there. And then just a wide array of this. So we're going to work with this. We're going to have to clean it up a little bit. We're going to have to work with redundant variables. And I think Isaac chose this particularly because he wanted to work with some redundant variables. Uh, what I'm going to mention is I'm going to detour a little bit from what Isaac does. And I do this for my own sake, um, not because I disagree with what he was doing. And also it's worth noting that he's doing certain things as a teaching tool uh, to go through it. But I'm doing it as a simpler way um, to approach the problem without having to explain more complex uh, aspects of the data sets, which Isaac aimed to do. Uh, this is my first detour. Uh, in this case, I changed, uh, which you'll see commented out here, Isaac chose to what's called df.drop, and he drops the survived column, which is right here. The reason he did that is because we're trying to predict whether or not the person survived, and you can either use survived or alive, and you don't need to use both. So he wanted to get rid of, oh, excuse me, he wanted to get rid of one or the other, and he decided to get rid of survived, he's going to keep alive. Uh, what he did, he... Uh, pick the axis that you drop it on, and you're dropping on the column axis, which is, goes row by column, row being axis zero, column being axis one. So he's going to drop that column, and in place it's going to say you're going to overwrite your data, and which is all well and good unless you have to rerun your data. If you drop it and you overwrite it, and you have to run this, this uh, cell again, or you happen to run this cell again, you'll get an error because it's going to be looking for the data frame column survived, and you don't have that. So uh, in order to overwrite that, you have to actually perform that exact function call. Uh, same axis, but in place we're going to put false, and I'm going to create an additional data frame, and I'm going to save it as a new data frame. And I have df dot, uh, underscore depth, so you can call it whatever you want. Uh, but just to show you what happens there, got a ant bite, I think. Just to show you what happens there, uh, when I print it, you'll see that uh, survived has now disappeared from our data set. Everything else is the same. Okay, we're going to select our dependent variable, which we'll use in a moment here. The dependent variable is saying, what are we trying to predict? We're trying to predict whether or not they are alive. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. It's written as text because we're going to use it as input in a future function. So just to check it, we can check our length. I mean, that's worth knowing. It's 891 rows. So we have 891 people uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, this next section here is a little bit tricky, um, but what Isaac does is have a conditional um, um, index. And that conditional index is going to be the length of our uh, data frame, which we found is 891. And you're going to select a random value where uh, 0.2 of those, or 20% of those, is going to be 1. And 0 0.2 of those is going to be, or sorry, 0 0.8 of those is going to be 0, or vice versa. I can never remember which. So let's find out. So what I'm going to do here is run just this. So let me go ahead and comment out those. 
So I'm going to run it, and then what I'm going to check is the condition where every the conditional where everything is false, and you'll see it's 191. So it should be roughly 20% of this. It's not going to be exactly, but it'll be roughly that. Okay, so uh, that's where basically everything is going to be zero. Uh, if I want to check it again, I can just do con, and you'll see true, 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 false. So this is just a list of trues and falses in a set ratio. Okay. I'm going to comment this out now. So the next thing it's going to do is it's going to take uh, uh, condi the conditional where it is true. So you at numpy dot where that just means true or false. And if it's true, you're going to print out all the true ones, and you're going to set that to the train value. So that what we're doing is creating a training data set or data frame and a validation data frame. And all that is doing is saying we're going to create a training data frame that's 80% of our data, roughly, and a validation frame that is 20% of our data. And this tilde just means not. And what that's going to do is find everything that's false. The next thing you're going to do is take the splits, which actually just gives you, uh, I believe, the indices of that. And then here you actually don't need the lengths of these. These are just to check to check your, your values here. Okay, so. We have, we've kind of set up our training data, we've set up our validation data, and really what we've done is set up the indices of these. We haven't actually set these uh, separate yet. Just to check that, we have that here, and you'll see 0, 1, 2, 5, 7. So you're missing a couple numbers there, which actually will be present in the validation data. Oop. Okay, now let's see if we do valid 0. Okay, so from that, we want to see, uh, this is where kind of Isaac gets into describing what's going to be occurring for, oh, and also a lingering thought. When I reran it, it changed my value, so that's that would be why those values didn't add up. Uh, that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay, so the next step down is where we're actually going to take uh, the, we're going to figure out which classes are present in our data, and the classes are going to be a, an item of interest. So we have first class, second class, and third class, and we find that out just here. We have third, first, and second, and they're not necessarily in order. Um, but the reason that he printed these out is because he wants to figure out uh, what these are, and he wants to actually turn them into numbers so we can work with them. So this is another um, uh, detour that I've selected to take from, from Isaac. Uh, but what he had basically, you had um, the classes set as a type of category, and those would reset the category of class. Um, the another option to um, excuse me, and, and he actually created the classes there, um, and then he actually set those in order. So, you know, very nice, wonderful, it was great. But again, you're going to have trouble when you go to run this this again. It, if you have to come back to this um, uh, cell and run it again after you, after you do it, you're going to come up with an error. So what I put in was basically where you're going to try something and you're basically going to see if this exists. Um, if it does not exist, you're going to um, just print the header. And if it does exist, you're going to drop uh, class. So let me see if I did this correctly. Uh, Okay, and if I run it again, we should get a header. And let's see, oh. Okay, so what Isaac does here is uh, create a, uh, or he basically explores the data a little bit to find this class section. And the reason he does this is because he wants to actually uh, categorify it, which is basically going to take it as instead of saying third, first, or third, first, second, it's going to say three, one, two, and it's going to be numerical. Um, the problem with that, or not the problem, he was doing that to basically explain that you have two variables that are identical, which is going to be if we come up here, we have P class and we have class, and they're going to actually have the, the same values. And when you go to run the, the model, you're going to find out they're redundant. redundant. They're, totally correlated. So they're unnecessary. And he wanted to work with that. He actually wanted to explain that. Whereas me, I find that fairly complex. So what I did was actually remove um, 
the class variable in and of itself, and I only worked with P class, which is already numerical, so we didn't have to bother. Um, so what I changed was he actually had it set where he actually selects the classes, puts them in order, he uh, finds them, he sets them as a category, and then he actually categorizes them um, on the data set. What I'm going to do is actually just see if that is a value. Uh, the reason that I'm checking if it's a value is if I've already run it, uh, what I'm going to do here is actually remove this value. So, uh, and if I've already removed it, it'll pull an error. So I'm going to try it, and if it doesn't work, then it's going to remove it here. And if it does work, uh, it's go excuse me, if, it, if it doesn't work, it's just going to print a header. And if it does work, it's going to drop the axis. So we'll go ahead and run it. And then when I run the header, you'll actually see that class is now gone from our data set. So um, I, I cheated a little bit. Again, Isaac's blog post goes in much more detail of how to handle these. I just wanted to walk through the basic steps of it and why he's doing these things. Okay, so we've kind of set up the data. Now we need to actually set up the model. Um, the first thing he does is actually re, um, reset the data into what's called a tabular pandas module in the fast AI model. In doing that, you have processes which are called categorify and fill missing. Categorify is going to take any variable that is not a number and it's going to turn it into a category number. So where we have man and woman or male and female, it'll be things like zero and one. Where you have S and C, uh, S will be one, C will be two, something like that. So you have a number that actually dictates um, the, the value. And then fill missing is actually going to fill in this missing value here. And I believe it fills it in with either the median or the, um, uh, the uh, mode or something like that of the, of the values. In addition, it sets up an additional column that dictates whether or not that was a missing value. So it actually adds to the, the power of that. So we're going to create what's called PROS, which is processes. Then we're going to select um, the continuous and the categorical variables where we have um, the data frame, we have this value, and we're actually going to, um, I believe that's for the columns, if I'm not mistaken. And then we have set our de dependent variable to, uh, where was it? Right here. We have our dependent variable set to alive. Dependent variable, again, is what we're trying to predict. So now we're going to actually set these up just to see what these look like. Let's actually create this. So we do cont, and you'll see all the variables that are continuous, P class, age, sibling value, uh, but cannot remember what part stands for, and fair. And then if I check for a cat, you'll see these are the categorical values. Okay, so we've actually kind of made a pretty good job at understanding what's going on here. Uh, now we're going to set it to this tabular pandas format. And we take the data frame here, the processes, the categorical variables, the continuous variables. We take uh, the Y names. Y, again, is another name for what we're trying to predict. We have X as the input, Y as the output, and it's going to be set to dependent variable. And the splits, the splits are basically going to split it to a training set and a validation set. And if you recall, we actually designated splits here. So here we, if we, let's see, let me create a new cell and we'll actually just write splits. Let's see what it looks like. So it's just an array and I believe, let's see if we have one value and then we have two value. And that's the training set and the validation set that we're looking at there. So, okay, so let's go ahead and run that and we'll have our model. Oh, we got an error. Oh, that's because we got to set these here just so we have the sizes. So let me. This uh, we have to essentially force the size to be a certain size. Okay, and this is not going to run just because we've already run it. So let's do that. And then here we should be able to still run that because we saved it. Okay, and let's see if we can do it. There we go. So uh, basically it's looking for uh, matrices of the same size. And uh, if you don't set that zero value, it's actually gonna have, I believe, a two-dimensional array or a, I believe it's a two-dimensional array where the second dimension is empty, but you essentially have to erase that second dimension. Okay, so now let's actually check the lengths of, of the training set and the validation set, and it should be roughly 80% and 20% of that 891 value. 
And to me, that looks relatively close. So it's it may not be exact, but it's close enough. Uh, let's see, and now we can actually see our values here. Uh, we're gonna look at the three top values. There we are. Okay, this is our new tabular pandas format that we're, that we're dealing with. Okay, and here are the items. So there's just a few different things you can do with it. And TO, again, I've actually asked Isaac why, why he chose TO for the name of this data set, and he actually said there's no particular reason, it's just convention that, that these groups actually use that. Okay, so now we've set up our tabular data set. Um, we are sorry, it's a tabular panda set. We've tweaked our data as, as needed. Now we actually want to train the data set. So he actually runs two functions in line here with a comma splitting them. Uh, the first thing is uh, to.train. And, and it, we're not actually training just yet. This is actually designating the, the training set. So we're almost there. So to.train.xs. Or it stands for essentially exits, which is essentially the variables you're putting in to uh, as input. And that will become shortened to just excess. Then the same for the Y, that'll be shortened to Y. Once we have that, you also not only have a train uh, subcategory of your data set, but you also have a validation set. So you're gonna do the same thing with the validation set where you have your X's and you have your Y. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, and here we're actually going to set up the model. So we're going to have a random force classifier with the number of estimators as set to 100. Then we're going to fit the model. So you designate the model as M, sometimes it's called MDL or something like that. And you uh, are going to call M.fit, and you're going to fit the X's to the Y. Go ahead and run it. Okay, and here we're going to import a few additional things. This, I think, was actually my input here. Um, so Isaac, I believe, uses the scikit-learn.metrics uh, confusion matrix. What a confusion matrix gives you, let's go ahead and import them real quick, is basically the number that you got right in your predictions uh, for, let's say, survived, versus the number that you got right for not survived. And it also includes the number that you got wrong for survived and the number that you got wrong for not survived. If you pull the simple confusion matrix, you use the input of Y and the predictions from the X's, you'll see you have 431 correct, and there's 279 correct. This is uh, true survival. This is true death. And this is, I believe, uh, false survival and false death. I may have those axes screwed. Um, but uh, I found out that you can do this a little bit more prettily. So what I did was import something called plot confusion matrix. And you use the estimator, which is your model. You set your x value and you set your y value. So we plot that and you just get a prettier picture. So here you actually have the labels as well, which is very nice. And I believe you can set those, but there's really no need here. So zero is deaths. So I had, the, I had them a little rotated here. So we guessed 431 people who died did die. And we guessed 279 people who survived did survive. We also guessed um, one person as a survivor, but they actually did not survive. And we guessed six people as dying who actually survived. So that's what this confusion matrix shows you. And then we also are going to take the same thing. That was the training set, right? So now let's actually see the validation set. The training set should be really good. The training set, we put in the data. The model adjusted to get the best value for that it could for that data. For the validation set, it hasn't seen this. So we're actually going to check. And you'll see the value is much different. That said, it's not bad. Um, it, keep in mind, it's a smaller set. This, is, this was 80% of the values. This is 20% of the values uh, set by the splits that we selected earlier. So we guessed 92 uh, who, who died, did die. We guessed 44 who uh, survived, did survive. And then we got 25 where we guessed that they survived and they actually died. And we guessed 13 died, but they actually survived. So you can see how we're performing now. And as Isaac actually starts to look at the, uh, the accuracy behind this and all, as well, that's all in his blog, but I'll save that for later because that's interesting, but it's not necessarily the, the, um, the step in line with the steps here. So the next thing he's going to do is, I have a little bug, 
the next thing he's going to do is actually create parameters. And the parameters all have to do with the model. It basically has how many um, times you're going to run the model, how many different sections that you're going to guess along the way, how many things you're going to kind of allow for movement in the model. Um, we're going to create this. And you'll see that we're creating number of estimators, a max depth, a minimum sample split, and a maximum number of features. The, what we're going to do, though, is actually we're going to start with 20 estimators. And we're going to go next by 20. So it's going to go 20 plus 20 is 40, plus 20 is 60, plus 8, 20 is 80, then 100. It stops at 100. So what this range value does is it says start here, increase by this, and stop here. Or start here, stop here, increasing by this value. Um, and then here you'll, you'll notice each one of these has to be the same number of um, steps. So 20 by 20 to 100, I believe is 20, 40, 60, 80, uh, 100, 5. And then you have the same here. Well, 2, starting at 2, going to 10 by 2 is also 5. So we kept the values the same here. I think Isaac uses actually larger values, and I decreased these specifically because it takes a long time. I think it's about a two-hour window. Um, using the values that he uses. So I, I shortened it just for the sake of the video. Using long, larger numbers should potentially give you a better output. So we went ahead and ran that. And then what we're gonna do is actually this grid search. And what the grid search is gonna do is run the, the random force classifier over and over and over with every single combination of these parameters. And then end jobs, I can't remember, but negative one I believe means that you're actually um, not using it. Oh, right here. Uh, it means that it's going to use processors on your computer. Um, so if you set it to zero or one, I believe, it's going to use one processor on your computer. If you have multiple processors on the computer and you set it to negative one, it will actually use all those processors. So we're going to head and run it, and I will likely have to pause the video here and restart once it's done, but let's see how long it takes. Very quick. So we actually did all right. Um, shortening those numbers, I think, exponentially decreased the time used. Okay, so we have the model. It's all set, everything's well and good. Let's actually use it to fit the model. And just for note, he uses the, the CLF variable name. Um, CLF just stands for classifier. So it's, it's a common uh, name for it. It's not some fancy statistical table or something. It's just a classifier. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna take the best model and we're gonna fit it to the data. So we do that, and I think this is actually where the time takes. So here we actually set it up. Uh, and then here is actually where we're fitting it. So that makes more sense. So I may have to pause the video here and then I'll reset it uh, once this is done uh, recording. All right, so we're back recording. Uh, it, it actually ran the model just fine. And now what we can actually check is one of the method, methods in here it, I can call is actually best score. So you can actually see what percentage uh, you got right, which is actually pretty good. We got 82% uh, correct. And if you think about it, that's I mean, so it's a 50-50 chance on each one of these individuals, but we're trying to guess using several variables. Um, and so 82%, that's, that's not too bad, I don't think. I'm sure Kaggle's doing a bit better than that, but then we, we did all right. Okay, so again, we're going to plot now the uh, confusion matrix, but here we're going to use the CLF.bestestimator, which is the best model uh, that we found. So here on the training set, you actually see it, it, it's, it actually decreased a little bit in, in, um, in accuracy. So we have 409 uh, guessed correctly, and up here we had 431. So, and we had 23 incorrect here in the corner and one there. So our training set actually decreased in accuracy, um, which at first seems not good, uh, but then you think about it, and there's a reason for that. If your training set does too well, it means that you basically memorized all the values uh, in this. Your computer just stored all the values and was able to do it when it sees new data that it didn't really learn anything. So here the goal is basically you decrease the specific uh, learning modality to, the, to that specific data set and you generalize it. And you generalize it so that anything else that comes in, you have a more accurate uh, disposition to, to guess that. So let's see how we did on the validation. So here's the validation set. We went up from 92 to 102 and up from 44 to, well 43 went down a little bit there, but overall we got quite good. We increased it quite a bit. Okay, so now is where Isaac gets a little bit creative and he's trying to figure out which features were actually were the most important. Can he remove features from this? Or um, in his case, can I? he's 
concentrating specifically on redundant variables, but you can actually do this to see if there's just some variable in here who, that may not have anything to do with your data set, um, can you just remove it? You can speed things up, maybe improve a model. I don't know if that actually occurs, but you can definitely speed things up along the way. So this feature important is gonna take his model and his data frame. What it's gonna do, and here I actually wrote it, creates a data frame with column names, which is selected from the data frame, and it has the uh, model's feature importances. And the feature importances, let's see if we can print that real quick. So if we just do m dot feature, and actually let's do clf f dot feature importances, I think. No, it's m. m dot feature importances, and we run it. These are essentially each feature in order, uh, and they're importance in the model. So you'll see this one's 22% important. Uh, but I'll call it percent, 12%. Whereas this one's 0 0.19, 0 0.16, much, much lower. And if you go just select model and you click tab, you can actually see in here, you have a lot going in here. So if we actually went to, let's see, feature importances, let's see if we have, what is estimators? No, that's not what I wanted. So there should be one that says, there's get parameters, number of features, number, uh, I think you actually can call, I won't, I won't do it for this video, but I think you actually can call it where you actually call the different features, but uh, that'll get your feature, feature importance on that. So let's go ahead and run that. And, oh, here we go, I have it right here. So this was feature importances, and then aside from feature, feature importances, you can actually look up the column names and that's where they're actually associated one-to-one -one for those. So you'll get an idea of which values were the most uh, important there. Okay, so let's see here. Um, and I didn't want DF columns. I wanted, I actually wanted DF depth. There we go. And depth. So let's try that. There we go. And oop, there are uh, depths, and that should be depths. There we go. So now you have them actually in order there. Um, okay. So uh, next, we're actually going to take the feature importance. We're actually going to run that, and we're going to save it as a variable. So the output is going to give us what most important fe features are. The ID is going to be the column number, the columns, the column is the column name essentially, and this is the feature importance. So you can see whether or not they were alone is actually extremely important to whether or not they survived. Uh, what deck they were on was extremely important, how many siblings they had, what class they were in, uh, how old they were, whether they were adult male, uh, where they embarked from was a little bit important, were they, were they alive, uh, obviously, um, and fair, sex. Etc. So everything's pretty good on that. Um, although I think, let's see. Oh wait, this should be DF. Oopsies. There we go. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, that makes more sense. Now they're aligned correctly. So I was I was incorrect in my previous call. So what fare they paid? There we go. Has the highest importance. And the reason this is DF is because you're actually claiming it from here. I had uh, gotten ahead of myself there. So you have fare being the most important. Basically, how much money did you spend on your ticket? How old were you? Were you adult male? Again, adult male and sex are pretty related. Uh, who and uh, sex are very much related. Um, passenger class, um, etc. So I'm guessing the reason these are different is because there's probably some missing values in one or the other, uh, but I, I don't know that for sure, for sure. Okay, so we have our feature importances. Now we actually want to plot it. So he, he creates a function called plot fi. Plot fi is going to take the columns, it's going to take the feature importance, and it's going to plot a bar graph. And then here we're going to plot the first 30. So here you go. So here you actually get a nice understanding of which feature was actually the most important for the prediction, and you can see that fair age and adult male were the top three. Okay, and I don't know if that's whether or not you survived or or passed away or both. I'm guessing it's 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 a prediction. So you're it's you know how you performed on either end of it. So it doesn't mean that necessarily if you were 
older that you were more likely to survive or you were less likely to survive. I don't know which direction that goes, but I know that it was a, played an important factor in there. Okay, so next, what Isaac does is actually remove um, uh, variables from this. And what he's removing is ones that have very low significance. And he sets the value to 0 0.05, which means essentially like a 5% cutoff, if you will, um, of importance. I, I, I inquired with him whether or not that, why he picked that value. And the reason was he actually wanted to leave in, uh, or excuse me, he actually had, had since lowered that value so that he could have some redundant variables in there. Um, so maybe you lower it to 0 0.4 or 0 0.2, and this is essentially what you would have set there. Um, but we're gonna run it how he had that, and we're gonna leave it in that, and it says that he kept seven um, features, essentially. So now we're gonna have uh, the X's for importance, uh, the validation X's for importance, and we're only gonna have the seven that are important. So we've kind of created our new sets now. All right, so here, once Isaac has all the, um, the important variables uh, left and the, the unimportant ones gone, uh, he's gonna rerun the grid search CV. So what this does again is you're gonna import your model, you import random forest classifier, uh, the parameters that you have set in, the number of jobs again is gonna be whether or not you use all your processes or just one, and then we're gonna, you go ahead and fit. So now what we're doing is, uh, and we're gonna fit specifically to this new um, uh, data set that only has the important variables. So let's go ahead and run it, and it shouldn't take too long, but let's see. Okay, so the uh, grid search is actually run now. Uh, we fit the model. Um, now let's actually see how we did. So again, we're gonna plot the confusion matrix here. And it looks like we are at 416 uh, true deaths, uh, guess correctly. 216 true survivors, guess correctly. And we got 15 survivor or deaths incorrectly labeled and 48 uh, survivors incorrectly labeled. So this is uh, set to the basically the variables for the uh, important variables, uh, but we've used it for the training data set. So for comparison, we come back and here's our comparison data set, 416, 226, 15, and 38. And pretty close. So 416 and 416, both were, uh, the deaths were correctly guessed. We have 226 down in the lower right. We have 216. So we, we incorrectly guessed uh, 10 um, survi uh, survivors uh, more. We, we incorrectly guessed those. So let's actually see then how we do on the validation set. And now we have 109 uh, deaths correctly get, uh, predicted and 15 uh, survivors, excuse me, 57 uh, survivors correctly identified. So let's see here. Um, that went from 107 to 109. So we've actually improved that. And we have 57 on the end here. And we have 58 there, so very little change, a slight improvement, if you could argue, uh, by actually removing a few uh, variables, which is very interesting. Uh, so let's see. So here I had actually previously run, and you'll see the numbers differ just a little bit here. But let's see, our, our best estimator here used a max depth of 60. It had a minimum sample split of 8 and number of estim estimators of 40. So the next step in is uh, where Isaac starts to kind of visualize the reasoning behind these removals of um, variables. So he creates a function called cluster columns. This is going to take your data frame and it just automatically uh, uh, states the figure size and as well as font size. Because what we're going to do is have a plot with, with some, some uh, sizing on it. So he calculates the correlation of each variable. Um, with that, he then has what's called a correlation condensed. And he uses this, and it's basically one minus the correlation. So this does some interesting stuff. So if you have 100% correlation, you essentially will be a correlation condensed of zero, because it would be one minus one. And if you have no correlation, it would be set to one. But what's also very interesting is if you have a negative correlation, it creates a value larger than one. So it actually creates a little bit of an interesting aspect. Uh, to do this, he runs a Spearman um, R, as, a, as opposed to the Okay, it's a Pearson R uh, coefficient. And the reason for that is because we're dealing with categorical variables. Um, then you have this HC, which stands for, I believe, hierarchy cluster, which has some 
um, definitions that will be used in the, the figure itself. And it's just basically um, uh, how to create distance in this graph. So here you create that distance using uh, the previously mentioned cor correlation condensed and you're uh, saving it to Z and Z is actually going to be used to call this histogram, or excuse me, this dendrogram here, which is kind of like a tree shaped plot. And then we're going to show it. Uh, I, ha I have created these commented out sections mainly because I was trying to figure out what these values were producing. I had an idea of what correlation was, but not how he was using it. Um, and this correlation condensed what it actually meant. So I just wanted those values printed. So I left that there for, for you. If you want to dig into it, you can actually add these to the code. And each time it runs, it'll actually print one or the other. So you can uh, comment those out. So let's go ahead, run that uh, function. And we're going to call it on the x's, which is the input values of the variables where we've removed the important values. So here's what's less, left. And what's very interesting here is you're going to have, um, basically you have an X axis, which again, anything over at where you see a fork at zero will actually create, it, it basically is telling you that it is 100% correlated or it's the exact same um, information. And we've removed a few of those, but remember if we had P class and then I think it was class, which was P class was one, two, and three, and class was first, second, third, they would correlate 100%. Um, so, and then who and age are, are, you know, correlated, but they're correlated at a much smaller value. And one minus something to get to about 0.7 would be about 0.3 correlation. Deck and fair are up here, and sex and adult male are the most highly correlated. And that makes sense because it's adult male, and sex would obviously have male or female. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning, and this actually confused me at first, is in the data set there's a variable called who. And who uh, in the header uh, shows it as male and female, but it turns out that there's an additional uh, aspect called child. So it's actually more information than just male and female. Um, what that gives you is uh, a little bit more variety in the data, and it actually makes the data much less correlated. So. Also worth mentioning, these are kind of segregated into two main groups. You have sex, adult male, P class, and then you have who, age, deck, and fair. And the reason there are two groups is because there are two sides of this split. So one side is this red column, or red splits, and the other side is the green splits. And you notice the split for the blue is at one point, roughly 1.3. And I mentioned earlier that if you have a negative correlation between values, you have a value larger than one because of this correlation condensed function. So that means that these two groups here are negatively correlated, which I would guess since adult male is here, uh, along with sex and P class, I'm going to guess that these values are correlated uh, closely together in the sense that they are more likely to have you uh, not survive. Being a male, I believe, was uh, detrimental. On the other side of that, is age fair and who so as fair increases that value will actually be more likely that you will survive so paying a higher fair means you're more likely to survive uh, it also means that you're likely on a, a certain deck uh, a certain age and etc so these two sections are basically if i understand it correctly stating that this you know group in red is less likely to survive if you're in one direction where it's negatively correlated with survival, whereas the green section is positively correlated with survival. And of course, if sex was coded the opposite, where male or, you know, versus female was zero versus one, or and vice versa, if it was coded the other way than it is, it would be on the other side. So that correlation would swap based on that. Okay, so once you have that kind of understanding, then you actually want to know about accuracy. And I mentioned I wasn't going to go into detail on how he gets into the accuracy, and that's in the next line but I will tell you what he's doing here. So I won't go into quite as much detail, but you'll get a good understanding. So here he's just gonna print accuracy followed by um, some calculations. And what this is stating is we're gonna pull from the confusion matrix. Here we're gonna create the confusion matrix using the validation um, uh, output, using the best estimator to predict the validation input when you've removed all these uh, unimportant variables. This section here is basically taking the coordinates of that confusion matrix. So that's the top left corner, 0, 0. So if I recall, that's going to be the true um, deaths, predicted deaths. 
Then you're going to add, and I believe this backslash just means new line, you're going to add the confusion matrix value for the same information, except you're going to take the true uh, survivors, which is the lower right-hand corner. So if we were to go up, up I'll, I'll explain a little bit better here. So we're taking this corner, which is 0, 0, and this corner, which is 1, 1. And we're going to add those together. Then we're going to divide that total by the total number of predictions. What that is giving you is the total correct divided by the total predicted, and that's going to give you your accuracy. So here we go, we have an accuracy of 0.84. I think I had run this data previously and we'd actually gotten an uh, accuracy of about 0.86, and I don't think I tweaked anything on it. So running it, you know, depending on the, the split in your data and everything, you can get a little bit of variation in that. Okay, so then he creates a, a function called get accuracy. And get accuracy is actually going to uh, create the model with a lot of extra information. I'm not going to go into detail on that. So he's basically remaking the model. Um, then he's refitting the model using the, the freshly pruned data. And then he's pulling this exact same aspect of print the confusion matrix accuracy. So let's go ahead and check that out. And then we're going to use it. So variables, we're going to select sex, adult, male, who, age, deck, and fair, and we're going to iterate through those. And what's really neat here, what Isaac did I think is really, really useful, is he's going to drop one at a time. He's going to loop through it, and he's going to say, after I drop sex from the data and run the, data, run the model, what's my accuracy? Then after I drop adult male, what's my accuracy? After I drop who, what's my accuracy? He's doing one by one. So really cool process here. And what he gets is, after dropping sex, accuracy is 0.85, we've gone up. After dropping adult male, it's identical. They're highly correlated variables, so dropping one or the other really impacts it roughly the same. After dropping who, we're about the same as where we started. After dropping age, we've gone up again. After dropping deck, we've gone down again. And after dropping fair, we've gone up again. And it appears dropping sex, uh, adult male, or age, one of those three is almost identical, actually they are identical, which is very strange to me. Um, I'm wondering if I have a, a, a see here. Um, but regardless of, of, of my own coding mistakes, uh, what he's doing here is basically showing that dropping certain variables may, you know, decrease your model accuracy or may increase your model accuracy. And this is very worth testing. Uh, especially if it's you know a small enough data set in order to do so. Anyway, uh, I do hope this this whole run through is useful. If you notice, I've changed shirts uh, due to at home circumstances. We had to film for about a uh, 24 hour period. I say film, record for about a 24 hour period. So you get to see me in my upgraded attire. Um, but I do hope this video was very useful. Um, my buddy Isaac is extremely. Um, gifted in the way that he explains certain mathematical principles or certain coding principles. And he's incredibly blunt. So if you go to his blog and you read through these, these posts, you'll get, um, in my opinion, a much deeper understanding of things that are widely used and really kind of skirted over in either field. So please check out the, the posts. Um, I will be kind of regularly going to his website and pulling items of interest that I think I can provide a bit more detail on and I'll create videos for that. Um, but if you do see anything that he posts or of course if you see anything in particular that you'd like me to cover uh, outside of that, I'd be more than happy to cover that as well as long as I can.